There's an old abandoned hospital in Edmonton called Charles Camsel Hospital. And this happened to myself, my older brother, I'll call him Omar, and a couple of our friends. I was 18 at this time and we had gone ghost hunting this one fall night and we had gone to a cemetery that night hoping to see something. We spent about an hour or so there when one of our friends said that there was this hospital nearby and said that it was reported to be very haunted. We were getting nothing being at the cemetery so we said sure, why not, it was still early, it was only about 1.30am. So we made our way to the hospital, my brother Omar drove there, it was about 5 minutes away. We pull up to this hospital and it was fenced off with no trespassing signs posted all over it. Now I don't condone trespassing anywhere, make sure you get proper permission before doing any ghost hunts, but we were young and dumb, so yeah. Anyways, when we pulled up and got out of the car, we walked along the fence to see if we could get in somehow. That's when we heard some voices coming from the front entrance of the hospital, so we ducked down and silenced our own. It was a bunch of teens roughly the same age as us who were being escorted out of the place by security. I'd imagine that they've had many vandals and teens looking for a thrill inside the hospital, so they had security patrolling the area and checking inside the hospital as well. It was two security guards escorting them out and they walked them back to their vehicle. We thought this was a great opportunity to get in with no security for a while and we saw an open space not five feet from us, so we quickly went through the small hole and went in. This place was spooky, I'll tell you, and dark. We had flashlights, obviously, and we headed through the main entrance and decided to go through the hospital floor by floor, starting from the basement. We went through with nothing happening, and it was pretty much a bust. Locked doors to some areas, and we were sure security would be coming around again soon. But before we left, Omar suggested we try one more floor up, and we agreed to it, so why the hell not, I thought. And we went up, and Omar didn't have a flashlight, it was dark and hard to see, but the city lights and the moon illuminating inside a little, it was somewhat possible to walk around without a flashlight. He took the lead being the oldest in the group. We followed behind with our flashlights when we all heard giggling. It was faint, but we all heard it. We stood still to see if we could hear it again. We all heard it again, same giggle, but it was even more audible this time. It had been from a child and we were getting a little freaked out. When all of a sudden I see Omar dart straight down the hall, I ran behind him and I asked Omar what the hell and he said that he saw someone at the end of the hallway. I told him to slow down. For some reason I felt uncomfortable about this situation. I don't know what it was but something wasn't right. Omar was wearing a hoodie that night luckily for him. I caught up to him and grabbed him by the hoodie and pulled him back dropping him to the floor because I had seen something in front of him that he must not have seen for whatever reason. Dude, what gives? He yells at me. I said, Omar, look. And I shone the flashlight about two feet in front of him, and there right in the path he was headed was a big hole in the middle of this like cross section where it leads to other corridors. He got up, and we stepped closer to the edge, and it was a straight shot down to the basement, and we were several floors up. Now I know it was the basement because it was completely flooded at the time, and I threw a stone or a piece of cement down the hole just to see how far down it went, and sure enough we heard a splash at the end. After the stone hit the water, Omar and I heard a giggle again, and we looked up from the hole. Sure enough on the other side of this massive hole was what I say looked to be the figure of a little girl, and just as quickly as she was there, she was gone. Just gone again. I had my flashlight, and I shone it in the direction of the little girl, but there was nothing. Just the corridor with some hospital beds. That's it. I don't know what this thing was, and I don't know if it had ill intent to harm my brother. But needless to say, if I wouldn't have been there that day, he would have been severely injured. This started last week. We, my wife and I, have three kids, so our house is pretty noisy even at night. Our room is in the basement, so we hear a lot. We always figure that it was the kids tossing and turning, even sleepwalking. So last week, our kids went to the grandparents, and that's where the fun started. We began to hear knocking, tapping, and footsteps, and realized that it was not our kids at night. 
It being a 40-year-old house, I attributed it to settling and creaking, or so I told myself for comfort reasons. The week progressed and the noises just became the norm. That is until three nights ago. Three days ago, I was downstairs and watching TV. I had heard noises a lot from upstairs. I didn't pay too much attention to it because I was watching a movie. I had just pushed them in the back of my mind and thought nothing of it. This is until my batteries and my remote died. So I went upstairs to grab some. I heard the knocking and clicking sounds intensify as I walked up the steps. I slowed a little and they continued. So I reached the top of the stairs and turned into the kitchen, also facing the front room. The clicking noises stopped and I see a closet door, the one right next to my front door, close. It was open about a foot. I hadn't closed it either. As I watched it close, my only thought was I had caught a burglar in my home. I didn't move, I just yelled for my wife. I stared at the door and made a gun with my hand to signal my wife to bring it. She did and I cleared the house. No one, no sign of anyone being there. Again, I had suspicions that this was paranormal because the door doesn't move on its own. Trust me, I tried everything to get it to move. It's a stiff hinge door and I can't get it to open or close without applying force. It won't even continue movement once I stop applying force to it. Nothing really happened the next night. Last night, however, things escalated. I'm at a loss for what happened. The noises started in the room above me and worked its way through the hall towards the stairs. It was a tapping noise. It sounded like every few feet. As it made it to the stairs, I heard only one tap as it was coming downstairs. Then it started downstairs and made its way towards my room. Then a tap on my door. Then on the wall above my head. At this point, I know it's not any physical person and I'm completely freaked out. Goosebumps and I'm freezing. That wasn't the worst part. My wife woke up and proceeded to tell me about her dream. She had dreamt that a girl was upstairs, came down and into our room. It was an 18 or 19 year old girl. She screamed at my wife and burst into an intensely bright white light. She then woke up. Talking about it today, I'm less freaked out so I've asked questions. She said she felt that her name was Julie and that she was upset we hadn't noticed her, that she just wanted to be acknowledged. We live in a very small town and records aren't readily available for us to look to see if someone had died there or if there's any history or anything happening. We do know the previous owner rarely stayed there. She had stayed at her boyfriend's house more than she was at home. Our neighbors told us this. There has been several owners and none have seemed to have stayed for extended periods. Has anyone heard of something like this? I experienced sounds at the exact same time my wife dreamt of a ghost. What does it mean? Should we acknowledge this ghost? And how do we get rid of it? My mom's parents died when she was in her early 20s. Her dad died first of some health complication and her mom a few years later of an aneurysm. The two adopted my mother from Scotland as well as another girl, my Aunt Patty. They both loved children and always wanted some of their own but my grandmother couldn't bear children so that's how they came about adopting them. So both grandparents died well before my mother had any of her children. She always says it was such a shame as she knew that they both really wanted grandchildren and she wishes she got to meet them. The only pictures I've seen of my grandparents are two black and white photos of them in my den. My mother always spoke very highly of her parents and I'll see her tear up now and then when she speaks of them. When I was in the second grade, I had a dream about them. My grandparents were introducing themselves to me and giving me a tour of their house and boat. My mother never showed me their house because it was sold and she also never mentioned a boat. They made me a huge dinner and invited my aunts and my uncles, but in the dream they were children instead of adults and my grandma even showed me her famous saw she had made every Sunday. My mother never told me about this either. It was all very happy and upbeat. At the end of my dream my grandma pulled out my speech notebook. I had used a speech notebook because I had a speech tutor to get rid of my lisp at the time and began to write something in it. She then closed the book and turned to me and said, I have to go now. I love you. And I just woke up like that, and it was daytime. 
I ran into my parents' bed and told them my dream. I explained how the house had looked and my mom began to tear up. She said her childhood house was just as I was explaining it and then showed me some pictures that matched the house in my dream. She also explained her father's love for his boat and how every Sunday her mom would invite all the cousins over for dinner and she would make her special sauce. She was now crying pretty hard as all the details in my dream were very accurate. I then remembered the notebook and ran downstairs to get it. And there it was. On the very last page was written out, I love you always, Grandma, with a little picture of a boat drawn under it. I couldn't believe my eyes and ran to show my mother. Her jaw dropped and she began sobbing, now saying it was also her mother's handwriting. I'll never forget this experience, and I truly believe that it was my grandparents' way of meeting and connecting with me. I remember the first time watching The Blair Witch Project in theaters and enjoying those few moments of suspense, but now it does nothing much for me. I guess that's what occurs with any movie that you've watched 15 years after its release. However, I did learn something new about the film that a friend had informed me about. The Blair Witch Project was inspired from an actual legend of a witch named Maul Dyer who lived in Maryland, USA during the 17th century. Before I continue, I want to note that tens of thousands of innocent people throughout the centuries were falsely accused, trialed, and executed as witches. They were believed to possess supernatural abilities, cast spells, and even curse people while making pacts with demons or the devil. Today we know differently. Most of the victims were ordinary women who owned businesses, midwives, had knowledge in herbal medicine, lived independent, or didn't follow societal norms at the time. They became targets of jealousy, fear, hatred, political or financial gains, or when a scapegoat was needed. Maul Dyer was no different. The legend has been part of Leonardtown and St. Mary's County, Maryland for 300 years. There are no historical records of Maul Dyer, yet all the town's residents know her story. According to legend, Maul Dyer migrated to Maryland alone with no one knowing her past or origins. She lived in a cottage just outside of town, which was then Seymour Town. Maul was a strange woman who lived alone and isolated herself from the daily events of community life. She was known to be an herbal healer that sold remedies to local town folk. Many of the residents were uneasy with her from the beginning, and over time suspicion would have them calling her a witch. As the legend goes, in 1697, Seymour Town was hit with harsh winter. During the fall, Crops failed and some livestock mysteriously died. With food already scarce, an epidemic hit the area resulting in many deaths from either starvation or sickness. With all that was occurring, Maul Dyer had remained unscathed. The locals soon blamed her for the misfortunes and hardship, believing she was truly a witch that cursed the town. Then, one night a group of the townsfolk gathered together and decided to put an end to the witch's terror. They set her cottage on fire. Yet Maul had fled into the woods. Legend says that even though she escaped, she was alone in the forest in the middle of the coldest night of winter. Several days later, Maul's body was found frozen, kneeling with one hand on a rock while the other raised as if crying out for mercy or a curse. The legend continues that when her remains were removed, prints of her hand and knees were left on the boulder. Many believe that Maul Dyer had cursed the town as the legend mentions harsh winters, poor crops, and disease continued to plague the area for several years. Over the past century and even today, strange occurrences are reported to happen in Leonard Town. There are accounts of those claiming to have seen Maul Dyer's ghost roaming the forest along with stories of specter animals, shadowy figures, a glowing fog, and abnormal weather patterns. The rock believed to have Maul's prints lays in front of the Leonard Courthouse where people have reported experiencing some ill effects. Ever since my dog died in 2014, my yard had become a place of utter terror. There are so many incidents of creepy things happening that I can't even type them all out right now. 
Needless to say, I don't really go out there after dark. Lately, there have been multiple accounts of both me and my girlfriend hearing horrible throwing up sounds coming from outside. I was downstairs making dinner, and when I came back up to get my girlfriend, she asked me, Were you throwing up outside? I wasn't. She said that she heard someone violently puking for a few minutes and then moving over to my swing set, which is where the noises stopped. This has happened at least three times now. What the fuck is this? I don't live in a place where people would be coming into my yard. I live in the middle of the fucking woods, pretty much in the middle of a huge swamp area. My neighbor is an old lady who lives there with her dogs, and I don't think she is puking in my yard near my windows. She has her own yard to puke in. And these sounds are like someone is literally dying and their guts are coming out of them. There has been no puke found, nothing dead, no blood, nothing. I'm pretty tired of these terrifying noises, so if anyone has any idea of what it could be, please let me know. The other night at about 2.45am, I'm awoken by a sound I can't quite place. You know when you're in that state of mind between being fully awake and still asleep? Finally I place the sound. It was a smoke alarm going off. My wife and I have two kids who usually sleep on the second floor, so immediately my first thought is to go check on them. As I get closer to the staircase leading upstairs, I realize it is the smoke alarm at the top of the stairs that is going off. I run up the stairs and by the time I reach the top, the alarm stops on its own. I thought that was strange, but continued to check on the kids. My daughter was awake and a little, understandably freaked out. She is seven. I calm her down and get her back to bed and thoroughly check the entire upstairs. No smoke, nothing is hot, and my son is still sound asleep. Weird. Now I need to mention that we have three rooms upstairs and the staircase hallway total of four areas and each has their own smoke alarm. Only the one in the hallway was going off. The smoke alarms we have are battery powered and I thought maybe a battery was dying or something and that caused the smoke alarm to go off. So I pull the smoke alarm down and check the battery. The battery was installed backwards. Not even kidding. Before I pulled the battery I tried pressing the test button and as expected, nothing. Hmm, now this is weird. The next morning I replaced all the batteries and all the upstairs smoke alarms. Normally most people would brush this off as just a one-off weird thing that happened, except this has happened before, twice before with the same smoke alarm. As I'm talking to my wife, we both realized this, and we both realized it's happened at the same time, within a half hour of 2.45 AM. Our house is pretty old, I believe it was built in the 1800s. We look back at the buying history, but before 1990, there is no other records, and we bought the house in 2010. This isn't the weirdest thing to happen. One night while my wife and I were lying in bed upstairs, when we first moved in, our bedrooms were upstairs. We had since moved our bedroom downstairs. My wife, or so I thought, kicked me right in the leg. I asked her, did you just kick me? She said no, and I asked, are you sure? Did you move at all? She said no and was puzzled why I had asked. I told her that I swore she had just kicked me and wasn't letting up on it. About that time, our bedroom door popped open, which wouldn't be surprising except the door was latched. We have had other weird things happen as well, but it has mostly been small stuff, things going missing or being moved, weird sounds, etc. When my wife and I first moved in, we put out a tape recorder to check for EVPs but never got anything on tape. We were both open to the paranormal, and the house my wife grew up in was extremely haunted. We normally don't notice any activity unless we are moving rooms around or remodeling. Any suggestions going forward would be greatly appreciated. My grandmother used to live in a creepy old house. It was kind of hoardery and a gated community for seniors. The previous owner had died in the house. We don't know if that's why there was so much paranormal stuff going on there, but it could have been. I lived there for several years with her and had plenty of experiences. 
One morning, her husband, who always got up a few hours before her, woke her up in almost a panic. Becky, Becky, you have to get up, he said. She likes to sleep past noon most days, but she heard the urgency in his voice and got up. He led her into the living room, where the blanket that usually was across the back of the couch was sitting straight up, as if someone was sitting underneath it. The thing is, nothing was under it, and I mean nothing. No sticks holding it up, no hanging from the ceiling, no pillows underneath, although it does have a pillow behind its back for comfort or support. It was completely empty. My grandmother was too scared to go up to it at first, so she snapped this photo from afar. It's crappy, I'm sorry, it's a pretty old photo. This happened many years ago. The date on the original email she sent to me is 2014. To address it before I'm sure it's asked, her husband wouldn't have done this as a prank. He's not fun or a jokester, he's more of the, uh, drink a beer stein or hard liquor by himself and fall asleep in a chair at 5pm type. After about a day she got the courage to go over to it after it was left in the living room for a bit. There were holes at the bottom where it would drape over the legs, which you can see in the photo, and you can also see the blanket draping over the arms. She looked into the holes and there was nothing in there at all. After two more days she got the courage to touch it. She poked it and the blanket immediately fell down, crumpled and flat like a normal blanket, nothing in it, and that was it. Now not a very eventful story, but it's one I definitely like and I love that photo. Everyone I've ever showed it to and told them the story got the heebie-jeebies right after and said the picture feels kind of uncomfortable. Sometimes if family stays with her, they request to not use that blanket. So this all began in 1989 when my mom was pregnant with my oldest brother Frank. Just some quick background, Frank got into a very bad car accident when he was 16 due to a drunk driver on the road and he lived through it, but barely. My mother has had a total of 6 pregnancies, with only 4 of those resulting in children being born. However, in all 6 of her pregnancies she always experienced extremely vivid and terrible nightmares with themes behind it. She usually experienced a different repetitive nightmare for each pregnancy. For example, while pregnant with me she had a frequent nightmare a couple of times a week about the world ending. With my sister, it was a repeating nightmare where she discovers that her pregnancy was never real and that herself never existed. With her first child Frank she began having intense nightmares two to three times a week about the same thing each time. She began keeping a dream diary. This is all she can remember. She knows there are parts she can't remember but this is the best she can do from her memory and her writings. In the dream, her dream self ironically begins seeing a therapist to deal with her nightmares. This therapist never has any face. It always has a black smudge over its face my mom's dream self never sees anything wrong with this. My mom will ask the therapist what she should do about the nightmares as they are greatly distressing. The therapist tells her that she better do something quick before her baby dies. This causes my mom to start crying and experiencing crushing pains in her chest. The therapist then tells her she needs to contact her subconscious mind. He tells her that her subconscious mind has urgent messages for her and that she needs to contact it immediately otherwise the nightmares will continue. The therapist tells her that she needs to do this by means of a Ouija board, pendulum or automatic writing. She tells her Ouija would do best, then there's a chunk of the dream she does not remember. The next part of the dream is her randomly finding a board in her basement and deciding to use it to contact her subconscious mind. She begins doing so and the board tells her many things about her baby and the future and the universe in general. The only thing she remembers is the board telling her that the baby was in severe danger and would someday be inches away from death. My mother's dream self would then have the sudden realization that she had been using this board for months now already and she was actually not speaking with her subconscious mind but instead with her therapist who she suddenly realizes has no face. Then she wakes up. These dreams were incredibly disturbing for my mother and pretty upsetting. She never had any belief in religion or the paranormal but considered herself open-minded. 
The dreams made her paranoid about Frank and made her wonder if there was any truth behind it. After all, she figured the human mind was a powerful thing, and maybe her subconscious mind actually knew something. She went on to have a healthy pregnancy. Fast forward two years, my brother Frank is now a toddler and my mom is trying to get pregnant again, with no luck. My mother and her sister are pretty close, best friends, and always jokesters with one another. One day my mom tells her sister that she used to have these terrible dreams while pregnant with Frank about Ouija boards. My aunt then tells her that she should experiment with one and see what happens. My mom is wary but agrees. She describes it as a morbid curiosity. They go to the spiritual store in town and buy a wooden Ouija board. They start using it as soon as they get back to my mom's house. They're asking it all kinds of questions and getting strange answers. My mom is sure it's just her sister playing a joke at first. They would ask it questions and it would answer almost in code or half words. My aunt asked it when she would get married herself and it said, three, three or four, few. They would ask it where missing items were and it would respond, gone, away from you, never again. Just weird stuff that made no sense really. My mom begins asking it questions about whether she will ever get pregnant again. The board says, trying, one. She then asks questions about Frank. She asks, how old is my baby? The board responds, one, six, again, making no sense. My mother says, no, he's not 16, he's two. And the board responds, 16, 16, big. At this point, my mom starts thinking this is all bullshit, but is curious and start asking the board about the dream she used to have while pregnant. She asks, why did I have those nightmares? The board responds again, making barely any sense with, large, 16, 4, 4. My mom asks if Frank is in danger, and the board says, later. My mom can't think of any other questions when all of a sudden the board's little planchette starts moving erratically, spelling out, TV, 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 156, 156, 156. My mom starts calling out her sister saying, stop messing with me. My aunt then swears she is not doing anything at all. My mom wonders if the board is telling her to go to the TV channel 156. They do this, and it's just a news station during commercials. My aunt says, well, let's wait until it goes back to the news stories. They do and there's breaking news about a large accident on the freeway with fatalities. They both get freaked out and put the board away. My mother says at the time she wrote it all off as her sister being a jokester and messing with her. Fast forward about five or six years. My mother's best friend who is very spiritual invites my mom to a group psychic reading. My mom only decides to go because the lady isn't charging any money and she knew it would make her friend happy. At the time, my family didn't have a lot of money and my mom tells me that she would never have gone had it not been free. During the reading, the psychic, who is also a medium, appears to be very accurate. About halfway through, the psychic gets to my mom and tells her that her grandfather is here with a message. My mom is confused as she only met her grandfather when she was three. She was hoping to actually hear from one of her deceased friends who committed suicide. The psychic lady tells my mom that it's an old message from years ago though there is really no time on the other side, so it's being brought forward today. The psychic tells my mom that her grandfather is saying, stop playing with that board. Turns out my mom and her sister used it several times after the first incident, but stopped after a year. The psychic says that her grandfather is saying that it's not good for her and her sister to use it without true knowledge, that some of the things it said were true, but that it isn't good to know the future always. Her grandfather then tells the psychic medium lady that my mom's friend who committed suicide will not be coming forward today, that he is gone now in a place that is far away, and that he is happy but does not wish to relive his past painful life, and that he means no offense to my mother, and that it is time to forget him completely. The psychic lady then asks my mother why she keeps seeing flashes of her going to see a therapist while pregnant, and that this is somehow tied to her grandfather's message. The psychic says there is something wrong with his face. He has issues. It's probably best not to see him anymore. My mom is too scared and doesn't bring up the nightmares she used to have. After that, my mother never had another experience again and did not go on seeking one. 
As I mentioned in the very beginning, my brother Frank got into a serious car accident when he was 16 and almost died. It was April 4th. It happened on a freeway and the accident was so big and horrific that it shut the freeway down with like six or seven vehicles being hit. The strangest part is that the driver was a therapist who was a very disturbed man with severe bipolar disorder, pretty ironic, who had a terrible drinking problem. At the time of the accident, he was fired from his job for giving inappropriate and unhealthy advice to a schizophrenic patient about how to deal with his delusions. He had to have surgery to correct the right side of his face as it was damaged in the accident. It was completely unrecognizable after and is now in prison because the accident killed someone in another vehicle. So there you go. My mom says there is a lot of this that can be written off as coincidence, sure. There are probably many rational explanations for everything that happened. But whatever the truth, my mom has decided to move on from it and never again mess with anything paranormal. She is open to hearing about other people's thoughts or opinions on all of this. She knows the mind is a very powerful thing. My mom is in her early 60s now and I always make her recall an experience she and her sister had when they were children. She hates it, but it's one heck of an experience. When she was around 9 or 10 years old, she shared her room in a bed with her sister, who was about 2 or 3 years older. One night, they were falling asleep when they both saw what they describe as a little man or tiny person sitting in the corner. It was dark, but they could clearly make out this thing just hunched over on its haunches in the corner like a scolded child. They were kids, not scared at all and gestured for the entity to play with them. She said the thing jumped on the bed and they proceeded to roughhouse together, having a fat laugh as they tossed the little entity about. Eventually they got bored and chased the entity off. It went right back to the corner it came from and sat on its haunches, looking depressed, but my mom and her sister just called it a night and went to sleep. To this day, my mom says she and her sis do not know what that was, and it was not too out of the ordinary as they were used to all things ghostly when they grew up. All I can remember her saying is that it was about three feet tall. She also thinks it might have something to do with an orphanage that closed down there many years before this. Apparently a lot of kids had a tough time there. This happened a few years back in a mountain suburb of Vancouver, Canada. This really happened, although I wish it didn't. My aunt had just purchased a beautiful home in this neighborhood, but being a business executive, she often traveled around Canada for work purposes. Her two children were at their dad's home for an extended period and their live-in nanny went back to her home abroad for a much-deserved break. Therefore, my aunt asked if I could house it, as the large house would be unoccupied, and she felt uncomfortable with that. I agreed to this, thinking it would be a small weekend break where I could lounge around and raid the fridge. The drive was about one and a half hours from my place, and I was generally eager about the whole thing. The nanny, who we were all very close to and who was like a second mother to my younger cousins, warned me before leaving that she thought the house was haunted. The country where she was from, the Philippines, has strong beliefs about the paranormal and ghosts and said that she routinely saw a woman dressed in Victorian clothing by the outdoor pool. She told me to do some special prayers for protection. Being a believer in the paranormal and experiencing things myself before in unrelated incidents, I took her seriously and was a bit frightened, but I figured at this point it was too light to back out. She left and I settled into the home. The first few hours were pretty uneventful. I just watched some TV, browsed the internet, and read some of their tabletop magazines. Eventually, I sort of forgot about what she had said about the haunting. I ate dinner, took a brief swim, and then things started getting a bit weird. I had that familiar feeling of being watched that most people report when speaking of the paranormal. I tried my best to shrug it off and realized that I had forgotten an extra towel outside one of the patio chairs back when I was swimming. When I went outdoors, the towel was floating in the middle of the pool. 
This freaked me out a bit, but I forced myself to calm down and watch TV, hoping it would distract me. I was watching reruns of my so-called life when the faucet in the kitchen began to pour out water. I went to turn it off and noticed that a single plate lay in the center of the floor face down. I put it away and nervously go back to the TV room, but sit in the corner with my back facing the wall because I was growing scared and didn't want something to sneak behind me like in a horror movie. From where I was sitting, you could see the outdoor pool through a glass wall screen. After about a half an hour, I noticed the water was sort of bubbling. I went close to the glass door to investigate and saw that it appeared that the water was moving as if something were doing quick laps back and forth, yet there was no audible splash sounds to accompany the movement. I also got an overwhelming sense of dread and goosebumps formed on my arms and on the back of my neck. I turned off the TV made sure all the doors were locked and sprinted upstairs to the master bedroom. I curled up under the covers and started reciting the prayers the nanny taught me before she had left. I must have stayed awake for what felt like hours, long after the sun had set, trying to will myself to sleep. I had left the lights in the room on because I was frightened. As I closed my eyes and tried to calm down, I heard a piercing scream that seemed to come from outside the window. The light then turned off, leaving me in darkness. At this moment, I'm having a heart attack, but I'm too scared to move. All of a sudden, the locked windows start to flap open and shut forcefully. They were the ones that had panes that open outwards, if that makes sense. Also, at the same time, the thick, heavy wooden doors in the hallway leading up to the bedroom began to do the same, causing loud banging, and I felt as if the whole house was shaking. These doors would not have been moved by a strong gust of wind only by the forceful movement of a hand. Also, the opening and closing of the doors and windows were all synchronized perfectly. After about five minutes, everything stopped. The silence was also deafening and all I could hear was my stifled but heavy breath. And then, I heard a sound that sent shivers down my whole body. The glass screen door on the first floor slid open and then shut. There were slow, methodical steps coming through the TV room and then up the stairs. It was as if each step were taken with intention, loud enough to knowingly scare me. Then the first door opened in the hallway, then the other, and finally the bedroom door creaked open. I shut my eyes tightly and listened to the footsteps as they approached the side of my bed. I felt as if a pair of eyes were piercing through the covers, then the footsteps moved to the foot of my bed. Minutes passed, and the presence and air in the room was so heavy, not one sound could be heard outside, not even the crickets that so often frequented my aunt's backyard. Then, all of the covers flew off of me and I heard a loud cackle, like one you might hear from a cartoon witch. I bolted up, packed my stuff, and left that house as quickly as I could, only stopping to lock the front door as the keys slipped over and over in my shaking hands. I left the screen door unlocked, but figured no one could get to it anyways as there was a big fence surrounding the backyard, and frankly in that moment, it was not my top priority. I checked into the closest hotel, too scared to drive home, and spent a sleepless night there calling my aunt in the morning. She seemed confused when I told her what had happened, as she said that she had never felt any ghostly presence there, but the nanny had mentioned it a few times. I guess she never really took it too seriously. She lived in the house for a couple of years after that and ended up relocating to Shanghai with her children for business purposes. We didn't really speak much of it, but when I told my mother, she said that she always felt creeped out there and told me that once while she was swimming, she felt as if someone had tried to push her head under the water. After that day, I always avoided that house, coming over only when necessary and when others were inside.